Welcome to another episode of the Tom Schumer Podcast. Happy Monday, everyone, and happy spring. All right, Saturday, March 20th, ushered in the first day of spring, and that, of course, means that there'll be more daylight each day and the warmer weather is on its way. So we're looking forward to that. March 20th is also my daughter's birthday. She turned 24 this year, so March 20th was a fantastic day all around. Thanks for listening in again this week, and as always, a big welcome to any new listeners joining in for the first time. Your listening and subscribing to the podcast means a lot, and I really do appreciate it. And as I always say, if you like what you hear and you feel up to spreading the word on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, or wherever you do, I would greatly appreciate that too. Uh, Today, I've got Matt Townsley joining me for the interview. Matt and I focus in on the implementation of standards-based grading at the secondary level. And to continue that conversation in Assessment Corner, I'm going to finish up what we started last week on leading change in assessment and grading. Today, we'll focus on steps five through eight. So that's today's plan. We've got a packed episode for you, so let's get to it. My interview with Matt Townsley is coming up. But first, don't at me. But I want to open this week by saying I think we've reached a collective breaking point and something needs to be done because if we're not careful, we're going to lose all perspective all resiliency, and our individuality. And if I'm being honest right here off the top, I was even hesitant to broach this topic this week because of the very topic itself. What's the topic? It's the relentless outrage that seems to be in our faces on an almost daily basis. Everyone seems to be outraged about everything. And this level of intensity has to stop. It's not sustainable. It's going to cause people even the most well-intentioned people, to start tuning out. I'm getting there, and I hate that that is happening to me. But we've got a serious problem in our society if we can't tell the difference between real and manufactured issues, between what should produce real outrage and where we're manufacturing issues because the Twitter mob decides you're done. And what's interesting is that while I was putting together my thoughts For this opener, a listener of this podcast sent me a link to an article entitled, Cancel Culture is Out of Control and Gen X is Our Only Hope. And so I thought to myself, well, I'm Gen X, one of the early ones born in 1967, so here I am to save the day. (laughs) Not quite. Cancel culture has now almost become a caricature of itself. And like most things, it no longer carries the same weight because every so-called offense is seen as equal. I don't know if it's a thing where some people saw the success or the influence or the notoriety some got out of real cancel, and now they want a piece of it, right? I want to cancel somebody. Now, politically, the right is now using cancel culture as a political rallying cry. And therein lies the problem. Somehow those on the right seem to think and see cancel culture as a politically left idea. Now, to refute that assertion, I give you Exhibit A, the Dixie Chicks, or the Chicks as they are now known. I give you Exhibit B, Colin Kaepernick. When Colin Kaepernick has a job playing quarterback in the NFL, or in some other capacity in the NFL, or he is retroactively compensated for what was clearly a freezing out of his ability to play in the league. When that gets reconciled, then talk to me about cancel being a leftist idea. But the reason this is happening is because people are exhausted. We should have real outrage over some things. We should have real outrage over systemic racism and the pursuit of real racial equity in our society. We should be outraged about that. We should have real outrage of the out-of-control misogyny in some places and the Me Too movement. There should be real outrage and action as a result of that. The canceling of Harvey Weinstein? Absolutely. There should be real outrage over the fact that so many of our indigenous communities across North America still to this day don't have clean drinking water. We should be outraged about that. We should be outraged about the negligence in Flint, Michigan that went on for so many years and still to this day is problematic. Real and sustained outrage should be directed to those and many other real issues that require long-term sustained efforts. But Mr. Potato Head is not the same 
as what happened to George Floyd. Sorry, it's not. Never will be. I see three major issues emerging in our society that are beyond just problematic. And the first is that we're losing our ability to apply common sense. You know, everyone always says, no one's perfect, but boy, in today's society, you better be, because there is no more offend, apologize, own it, and move forward. We're so afraid to express a different opinion for fear of the mob setting its sights on us. As soon as you say something like that, what I just said there, then you get the all too predictable responses and all too juvenile responses from people. Say, oh, oh, does that mean, Tom, that you think it's okay to be racist or uh, that that's just someone's individuality? Give me a break. Everyone knows that's not true and that's not what was meant. Have we lost all common sense? Are we all so busy trying to gotcha the next person we don't agree with that we can't use one ounce of common sense to tell the difference between a real or a manufactured issue? Between an out-of-character mistake and a long-term revelation of someone's true nature, we can't tell the difference between that anymore? Is that just off the table? On the one hand, we're told, you're going to make mistakes, just own them, apologize, and be better as a result. Yet, actually make one of those mistakes, and it's over. If every time someone expresses a thought outside the norm, the woke mob is on you, and then we're going to become paralyzed as a society. I mean, through most of my life, it was good to be able to see some humor in things or to be able to laugh at ourselves. Not anymore. That's off the table. And that term, woke, that alone has been hijacked. That the term woke reemerged recently as a concept that symbolized the perceived awareness of social issues and movements. Its origin was in the African-American vernacular, as in the expression, stay woke. But as soon as white people got a hold of it, hijacked the term, it became this character of itself, right? We couldn't help ourselves. We got all amped up about being woke and canceling everybody. We had to go and ruin it. So now woke has become this meme or derogatory reference. It started rightly as a reference to anti-racism and then rightly expanded to LGBTQ rights and women's equality and even into environmentalism. It became this generic term that really spoke to real issues about waking up and realizing what's happening in our society. Then it gets overused, it becomes diluted, and then it actually, ironically, provides political ammunition for those the term was originally meant to be used against or to expose. The second thing I think is happening is I think some are losing their resiliency. And I do think this is especially true for young people. Everything now seems to be referred to as a trigger. Really? Are we no longer able to look at a situation and just declare, you know what, that guy's an asshole and I want nothing to do with him. We can't be that fragile, are we? This can't be good for kids growing up, constantly afraid to have their feelings hurt. And again, I'm not talking about the serious issues that our society needs to confront. There are very real issues that go way beyond hurt feelings that need to be dealt with. But not everything is a trigger. You see what I just did there? I needed to throw in another disclaimer in case you're misunderstanding me. Now, the irony of me disclaimering my way through an opening where I'm lamenting the need for disclaimers, that irony is not lost on me. Triggered. There's another word we've ruined. What is supposed to be a reference to a very real mental health issue has been diluted to mean anytime I'm the least bit bothered by your difference of opinion. As far as mental health is concerned, an emotional trigger is anything, memories, experiences, or events, that sparks an intense emotional reaction, regardless of your current mood. Emotional triggers are associated with post-traumatic stress disorder. Not a movie from 100 years ago. Or a difference of opinion about assessment. It's not the same. And to conflate the two is utterly disrespectful and demeaning to those who are truly triggered. 
It's a little ironic, don't you think? Real people with real issues that truly trigger them are a critical mental health concern that must be handled with sensitivity and finesse. You're not triggered by the logo of the new Greek restaurant down the street. And now, of course, cue the responses. Oh yeah, Tom, what if it's a... The third issue I see is that we're losing our individuality. In 2021, if you don't perfectly fit the mold, then you're branded with a hyperbolic label, and then that's it for you. You're done. Now, you've heard me talk about labels and hyperbole on previous episodes. The message today is this. If you don't think exactly like us, you're out. This kind of groupthink, this kind of mob mentality, I actually think is kind of dangerous for a democracy. The level of conformity necessary in society right now is out of control, and it has to stop. It's exhausting. No one can keep up this pace. And as I said, I actually think it's a dangerous path forward. Like, what is the end game? When does it stop? When we all think alike on every issue? When there is no disagreement? When there is no debate? These differences of opinion are not going to go away. They'll just move underground and become subversive. Now, look, I know right now I might sound like the old man yelling at clouds, but honestly, I'm on your side. The work that's really needed in our society right now is where I want to direct my outrage. The energy needed for dismantling systemic racism and bringing about real racial equity is intense, and we need a collective energy for that. The intensity of our collective work around reconciliation with Indigenous people, it's heavy, and it's incredibly complex, and we need the energy for that. We need the energy for women's issues. They're complex and sophisticated, and there's a lot of work to be done. We need energy for the mental health crises in our society. They're real, and they require our full attention. That's where we should be directing our energy, not by conflating every issue as the same, but by thinking through the severity of the act or the issue and responding appropriately. Some people deserve to be canceled. I get that. Like I said, Harvey Weinstein, we can all rally around that, as we should. But some people who just say something offensive, you know, supposedly no one's perfect in this world, so we should expect missteps. So people who say something offensive should be given the opportunity to just own it, apologize for it, and be better because of it, without having this avalanche of hate branding hurled their way and having their lives completely torched. In our haste to ruin individuals, we're actually ruining our society. Everything can't be a five-alarm fire. As I mentioned last week, you know, the Ricky Gervais quote, just because you're offended doesn't mean you're right. The retroactive lens through which everything is now being judged will eventually catch up to you. Why? Well, because at some point you're going to be on the wrong end of something, and suddenly you'll be in the crossfire. Is there no more space for learning, growing, expanding, and being better? It seems we have to be born with a kind of societal purity that, quite frankly, no one can live up to or maintain. I mean, that purity test is usually applied through social media, so that should tell you everything you need to know about that. We need a societal correction. I don't know how we do it, but there needs to be a societal correction that says enough is enough. And maybe it begins by not staying silent, by choosing our battles. I mean, to stay silent about this issue or these issues is to let the vast minority of people in our society drive the collective narrative. We all have only so much bandwidth. We have our lives, our jobs, our children, our day-to-day -day goings on. Even the real social justice warriors out there have to take their kids to school. They have to make dinner. They have to pay their bills. They have to go to work. When we have time to direct our energy to important societal wrongs, they need to be the right wrongs. They need to be the wrongs that need righting. If we can't tell the difference between serious issues that need to be confronted and manufactured ones, then we have a serious problem. If we can't tell the difference between real victims and those trying to gain social mileage out of being able to claim to be a victim, then we're doomed because we will have lost all perspective, will have lost our ability to confront those real issues, 
and will have lost our ability to support those real victims because of the sheer volume that is being brought our, to our attention day after day. If we don't start saying enough is enough, then the perpetually outraged are going to lead us down a societal path that I, for one, want no part of. Joining me today for the interview is Dr. Matt Townsley. Uh, Matt is currently an assistant professor of educational leadership at the University of Northern Iowa. Uh, he is a former district administrator and secondary teacher in Solon, Iowa, the Solon Community School District. Uh, in 2017, Matt was named Iowa's Central Office Administrator of the Year, and in 2014, Matt was named an ASCD Emerging Leader. Uh, his writing can be found in publications such as Educational Leadership, School Administrator, ASCD Express. He's presented at national conferences like Learning Forward, AMLE, just to name a couple. Matt is the co-author of the book, Making Grades Matter, Standards-Based Grading in a PLC at Work. Matt and I share the same passion for assessment and grading, and that is why Matt is here today. So Matt, welcome to the Tom Schimmer Podcast. Hey, Tom, so good to, to connect with you, to see you, fellow Solution Tree author and fellow yeah. assessment and grading enthusiast. It's been a pleasure <laughs> as well to be a part of your podcast today. Yeah, thanks, Matt. It's uh, it's great to finally meet you. We, of course, run in the same circles. We run in the same social media circles. We we often are on Twitter chats and Facebook yeah. groups together, uh, but we've never met face to face. So this is the first time and uh, I'm happy to finally make that happen. So I want to center our conversation around assessment and grading reform at the secondary level. Yeah. But before we get into that, um, let's talk about your journey. Let's start with your assessment journey. Tell us a little bit about the arc of your career uh, so far, and then so maybe, you know, when, where, how did your passion for assessment and grading develop? How did that all sort of come to pass? Yeah, as you mentioned, Tom, I was a, as a secondary teacher, as a secondary math teacher, and I, I wasn't really that great of a math teacher, just another, you know, just another high school math teacher out there. And uh, one of the great things that my school district did is they provided um, uh, the finances for us as math teachers to go to the state math teacher conference. And so Every year I'd go and I'd try to bring back just one new thing to try out my classroom. Uh, it was about my fourth year of teaching or so, and I, I had a choice to make. Would I go to lunch early or would I go to this breakout session on how to fix, uh, how, to, how, how math teachers can fix their broken grade book? So I obviously went to the session, right, to, uh, to learn how to fix my broken grade book. And I came back from that, uh, that state math teacher conference just super, super excited. I will never forget the conversation I had with our high school principal at the time. It must have been maybe a day or two later in his office. I was just so elated as this early career teacher about all of these great things I'd heard. I just, I just, I was talking to him just to thank him and to debrief a little bit for allowing me to go, you know, paying for the sub and for my registration, and all that stuff. And, and I really anticipated that he was going to say, hey, you know what, thanks, awesome, you know, how can I support you type of thing. Um, but instead, he asked me this question what's holding you back from trying out some of those things you just shared with me? Mm. And I was like, oh, well, I don't know. You see, Tom, there was about nine weeks left in the school year. And I thought, well, it's kind of late in the year to be, you know, starting something new in my classes. But he really encouraged me to, uh, to, to just to try something out. And so I picked my last period geometry class and I started doing some different things with, uh, with the grade book that I didn't really know they were called standards-based grading at the time, but I just kind of learned through reading blogs and books and things like that. That's really what I was trying to do. And so um, to make a long story short, there was another teacher who taught right next door to me. And uh, he was frustrated one day in the parking lot about just teaching in general. Yeah. And he, he said to me, Matt, what, why do I assign so much stuff and then spend most of my time grading that same stuff that I chose to assign and then spend even more time tracking down students who haven't turned in the stuff that I assigned to them so I can spend more time grading it. <laughs> and he was just like, he was ready to quit teaching. Yeah. And so I just kind of shared with him some of the things that I was doing in my classroom. And so he became a, a partner in crime of someone who was going to try out this, this other stuff. And so mm -hmm. uh, then a couple of years later, I moved into a district office in the same school district there, never intended to try to make a big grading shift. But because of that, uh, that, that colleague I had and several other colleagues that just kind of came along, came on board. Um, I got a phone call one day in the district office from our, our new high school principal who principal who'd rehired. And uh, he said, uh, Matt, we've got a problem. In this one particular class, we have two teachers, as you know, teaching the same class. One teacher, as you know, is kind of trying out the standards-based grading thing, and this other teacher isn't. And we've got parents and kids who are in this class 
that wants to transfer their kids to the standards-based grading section mm -hmm. at the quarter. He's like, I, I, I can make that happen, but I can't make that happen like, you know, for the next five years. We've got to do something about that. Mm -hmm. And so that for us was a tipping point. To what extent we were going to kind of allow teachers on a voluntary basis to do these grading things different? Um, or, or were we going to go on kind of a, a district-wide journey to see if this was something that we all ought to be doing? And well, uh, history played itself out and uh, over multiple years, uh, we decided that we we're going to be an, an all-in standards-based grading school there in, uh, in Solon, Iowa. Uh, and it was just really neat. I call them the, the, the stars were aligned, the glory years of being a school administrator. Now, it wasn't easy. Uh, there was a lot of pushback from uh, different stakeholder groups, but it, it definitely was a meaningful journey. I learned a lot about myself as an educator. I learned a lot about how to lead change. And that kind of takes me to where I'm at today, Tom. I'm a, I'm a professor now. It's kind of crazy to call myself a professor, uh, someone in the, uh, in the ivory towers with all the great ideas. But now I teach yeah. future principals and superintendents how to lead change uh, curriculum, of course, grading stuff along the way. Yeah. It, it, you know, so many of us share similar stories about uh, whether it's breaking points, frustration, um, you know, getting to a place where it just it's not working for me anymore. And regardless of what label you put on it, and certainly I think sometimes the labels get in the way, mm -hmm. uh, you know, what is standards-based grading and people make a meal out of it instead of just realizing that, you know, I say to people all the time, standards-based grading is like SBG is GBS. Standards-based grading is grading based on the standards. Yes. That really shouldn't be that controversial in the 21st century that we base grades only on the evidence of learning that students produce, but nonetheless, it can be a challenging venture. So that leads me to this next Easy question, Matt, hashtag sarcasm. Uh, you are the co-author, of course, with Nathan Weir on the, the, the book I mentioned earlier, Making Grades Matter, a Standards-Based Grading in a Secondary PLC at Work. So my question to you is just to, let's start with a generic question, a, a view from say 20,000 feet, and we can get into some details for sure. But why from your perspective is grading reform exponentially more challenging to achieve at the secondary level, especially when we talk about the high school level? Why does it seem that no matter where you go, no matter who you talk to, it's, it always seems to be at the high school level where it's, it's just that much more challenging to make change happen. So why do you think that is? I think it kind of goes back to the title that we, we landed on, um, the fact that grades actually do matter a ton at the high school level. And um, it's been kind of an unquestioned practice as to what exactly those grades mean. And I think, I think there's been some assumptions and I was one of those teachers, I was one of those administrators who just assumed that um, five points in this class meant the same as five points in another class. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think grades just matter a ton in the eyes of teachers and students and especially parents. And that makes it very, very, very challenging to uh, kind of unravel what, what grades and points mean. I also think there's some other factors at play. Um, I think just in general, uh, high school teachers uh, tend to be very content focused. Mm -hmm. And so they are maybe not um, as student focused as perhaps maybe a, um, an elementary uh, teacher in general. Elementary teachers are, are generalists, uh, so they're not maybe as attached to math or reading or social studies. Whereas I just love teaching geometry. I love teaching statistics as a high school teacher back in the day. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think uh, by nature of being kind of uh, prioritizing the content, uh, that can get in the way a little bit. In, uh, in really the focus on the student when it comes to grading practices. I think a third thing that makes grading challenging at the, uh, the secondary level or the high school level is some of the structures and schedules that go along with it. Um, you know, I think of uh, my sister who has taught elementary before and I asked her, I said, so what do you do if a student is, you know, struggling with math? And she says, well, you know, there's just kind of certain times a day I can, you know, just pull them aside and help them with a certain concept because she had those same students for, you know, all day long. Mm -hmm. uh, a high school teacher does not have that same luxury. Um, when the bell rings, that's when class starts. And when the bell rings again, that's when class ends. And there's practices and fine arts events and, uh, and buses to get on and off that really kind of get in the way of some of the, uh, the supports that really students need to be successful uh, when we start uh, thinking about grading. And finally, I think um, just another, um, another reason that perhaps it gets uh, to be a little sticky at the high school level is because um, so many of our stakeholders, uh, th that was their last memory of school, high school. 
They remember it. They remember it. They remember exactly, or they think they remember exactly <laughs> how grading was and assessment was and how school was. And so they would like to enter into the conversation because they were probably fairly successful at it or were not successful at it, have some very strong opinions on how it ought to be. And those stakeholder opinions and those stakeholder perspectives often kind of play themselves out in maintaining the status quo. Um, and that's not always yeah. easy for us as folks who think that maybe grading ought to be a little bit different. It is definitely one of the hurdles is, is the fact that for parents and so many stakeholders, um, standards-based grading, sound grading practices, it just doesn't look and feel like it did when I was in school. And that usually produces an immediate pushback, even though you can eventually win them over and help them understand how it's more effective, more accurate, more clear, uh, that initial pushback. I wonder sometimes too, Matt, do we... Do, because I, I love the title of your book, and because I, I wonder sometimes if, and I'm, I'm using the royal we here, I, I wonder sometimes if we lose secondary audiences by trying to de-emphasize grading too much. And what I mean by that is, you know, we can, we can on Twitter and, and social media sites and, and uh, at, at conferences, we can definitely send the message that it's not about the grades, it's about the learning and all of that stuff. And then high school teachers are listening to that message saying, yeah, but Grades are the currency with which students, you know, gain acceptance into university and, and colleges. So you're losing me here because it feels it goes from being inspirational to maybe crossing a line to being a little bit out of touch with what a second. Do you, do, you, do you share that perspective? Do you think that's a possibility that maybe we are going well intentioned as those messages are? Are we going too far with with trying to uh, de deemphasize and crossing the line into a place where we're trying to eliminate, if you will? Thoughts. I, I, I share that perspective, Tom. In fact, I was talking with the administrator uh, last night, and uh, she she was sharing with me some of the things that they were doing in their school, and she almost felt guilty. She says, "Well, we're we're reporting based upon standards in the grade book, but you could just see the frown on her face. But we're still determining letter grades at the end." Like she felt like it was something bad, you right. know. Like she felt guilty, like she was sharing with mm -hmm. me, and it was something I was going to be disappointed in her and in, in doing. Um, uh, I think there's just some concessions that that we often make in secondary schools when we think about, you know, maybe the pure way it ought to be or the, or the way that we've seen it happen in maybe an elementary school setting. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I feel the same way about uh, the college and university setting. Like there's all kinds of things that we can cannot do in my in the classes that I teach. And so there's concessions that have to be made. Um, a phrase that I often use, Tom, when I kind of hear that, that um, that saying that you mentioned there about uh, are we losing track of what grades are? I say let's let's not let perfect get in the way of progress. Right. So if there's some specific things that we can do in our classes today, tomorrow, this year, next year, they're going to help us work towards the ideal. That's awesome. Yeah. But we've all read the book, we've all heard the speaker that just says you know we shouldn't have grades at all. Our grades are terrible, and we should go to a you know a, a classroom where there is no such thing as chasing grades. But um, there's got to be something. There has to be some way we provide students with feedback and, most importantly, just a status update. Whether that's a letter, a number, or something else, um, stakeholders are going to create meaning around that. And uh, I think we can just leverage what they're using, uh, letter grades, numbers, or otherwise, and make uh, better meaning as a result of it. Right. You know, a, a letter grade can be representative of a gradation of quality. Or it can be under the traditional model, uh, an averaging of old and new evidence and a predetermined percentage increment. I, I've been saying for years, you know, grades will be as meaningful or as meaningless as the adults make them. Yes. And and sometimes I think this rush to um, and it's this false dichotomy where feedback and grades are 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 put in this kind of contention or this kind of adversarial relationship when they don't serve the same purpose, you know, the formative purpose versus the summative purpose. When people say, you know, grades don't provide meaningful feedback to students, I think to myself sometimes they're not supposed to. Mm -hmm. The purpose of feedback and formative assessment is how you advance learning. Grades are a different purpose for assessment. And, you know, certainly a lot of the hyperbole you see, and I've, listeners know I've ranted about hyperbole more than once on this <laughs> podcast. Um, I just think, you know, the phrase I use when I talk to Tom Gusky about standardized testing, I just feel like sometimes we need an adult conversation about summative assessment and not fall prey to what's going to get me, you know, clicks and, and retweets and likes on social media. So let's talk about transitioning, Matt. So, so 
we understand that. What do you think the keys are? Like if, if there's middle school or high school teachers, principals, or, or superintendents listening right now, and they're thinking, yeah, you know what, we need to make the move as well um, away from traditional assessment and grading and moving to ones that more align with our modern instructional paradigm. What do you think the keys are for schools to think about when they, when they think about transitioning to that more modern assessment paradigm? Yeah, I think a couple of things come to mind. One is, um, and this might be a little bit controversial out there, but is to start small. Um, in some of the places that I've been, I've actually experienced this myself, is that sometimes there's a, a need or desire for, uh, for everyone to kind of take the huge giant leap at once, um, when not everyone is ready for that huge giant leap. Or let's be honest, Tom, like maybe a school invites Tom Shimmer to come in and, and talk with them about all these awesome assessment grading practices. But at some point in time, Tom Shimmer is leaving. Yeah. And, and you're going to do a great job, I know, Tom, of trying to build some internal capacity while you're there. But um, when we start small, when we start small and we take some of those folks who are really eager to, to maybe take that giant leap and they get excited about it, now their experience and their success is much easier to build upon when we take that next group who is willing to, uh, to get after it. So I think starting small can often be helpful. Of course, not just being satisfied with pockets of excellence but starting small with a greater purpose of utilizing um, an early group to uh, move the group later on. Okay. Another thing I, th oh, go up. Uh, yeah. No, another no, thing go ahead. Gonna, yeah, another thing I think was gonna, that's really helpful is um, starting with the purpose first. Uh, you know, we, we've heard of schools, right, that, uh, or educators that say, I'm gonna do this specific little tiny thing to, to my grade book. And, and that's gonna be this thing that everybody ought to do. But then everybody doesn't know why we're doing that specific thing. Right. For example, like we're not going to use zeros anymore. We're just going to do 50s instead. Okay, I can comply with that if district office says I have to do it, but I, I don't really understand why. Mm -hmm. And so if there's never really a, a strong purpose for why a school is changing their grading practices, I think we're going to, we're, we're just asking for permission to not have long-term buy-in. Right. Uh, and so I think by really trying to formulate a strong purpose for why uh, grades ought to change, and I guess as you and I agree that grades ought to communicate student learning and not mm -hmm. be a combination of, you know, points for practice and points for right. compliance and points for formative assessment and points for uh, understanding stuff. And so if there's just one sole purpose for that, when school leaders really focus their time and energy on that early on, I think there can be uh, some long-term understanding and long-term buy-in. And then some, of course, some next steps that result of that. And then a final thing that, that I think that we learned in, in my former school was hiring. Now, we didn't just look at resumes and say, all right, who has implemented effective grading practices? We started asking some key questions to those that we were hiring. We'd ask them like, hey, what, what percent of student achievement do you think that you're responsible for? And what we we're looking for in there is someone who had a, a, a high personal ownership in the student learning process. If someone's like, yeah, you know what, 50-50, like, you know what, I think the student ought to just do it. And I, you know, Sorry, you, were, you weren't making it to the next part of the list, right? Like you are not going to get hired in our school because you did not feel like you were a part of the learning process. And so I think Hiring is perhaps one of those um, uh, areas of, uh, of being a part of a, a high school or middle school that maybe is overlooked when considering grading reform. Yeah. I want to go back to um, starting small. I, I, I know what you mean by that, but I'm, I'm thinking about maybe listeners out there. Can you give us an example of, uh, let's say I'm a, you know, a high school uh, English teacher or science teacher or whatever. What's an example of starting small? Sure. Yeah. So uh, starting small could be a, an in, one, one individual teacher starting small. Like maybe I'm going to, uh, in addition to doing my, my traditional like 14 out of 16 feedback, I'm also going to disaggregate that essay based upon the specific learning targets or standards. I'm going to, in parallel, give students feedback on points and how well you understand the standards. So I'm going to start just real small. I'm not going right. to upset the apple cart in doing that. So that's at an individual teacher level. At a school level, starting small might involve as a principal saying, hey, you know what? I'm just not sure if my whole staff is ready to take this huge giant leap in grading. So perhaps what I might do instead is I might have uh, you know, five or six teachers who seem to be really willing and excited to get after it. And so these five or six teachers, we're going to commit to maybe uh, rethinking homework in a different way this semester. And also maybe to providing students for the first time uh, redos and retakes opportunities. We're just gonna see how it goes for a semester. We're gonna troubleshoot along the way. We're gonna meet every month and talk about our successes and challenges. And uh, we're going to try to figure this out together um, so that hopefully someday, a year or two from now, when we ask everyone else in our school to do it. We now have some internal solutions rather than expecting that we can, you know, read it from 
uh, one of Tom and Matt's excellent books that we wrote. <laughs> right. Those early adopters are definitely uh, role models. They, they, they do some of the heavy lifting and, and learning those lessons. But Matt, I'm sure you've had this question before because I have as well. How do you respond to somebody who says, but Matt, I'm the only one in my department who, who's interested in moving this direction. And if I start to make any even small changes, the rest of the department's going to be upset with me that I'm the only one allowing reassessments or I'm the only one that's accepting late work. That, that's going to put me in conflict with my, with my colleagues. How, how do you respond to the teacher who sort of asks that question or presents you with that scenario? Yeah, first of all, I just say, hey, I've, I've been that person. I was, I was the Lone Ranger <laughs> once upon a time, and it's not easy. And so uh, definitely thank you for your willingness to stick your neck out a little bit and to try these things. Uh, the second thing that I'm just a big fan of as a former teacher and school administrator is to seek permission from uh, the school administrator. Hey, I'm thinking about doing these things. I know I might be out, uh, out in left field or out in right field here, but you know, do, you, do I have my, my, your permission to, uh, to try out these things? And then third, um, I'm not a big fan of surprises. And so I'm going to sit down with my colleagues and just have a conversation with them and say, hey, I'm going to try these things out. Um, a little bit of maybe action research, I'll call it, or a, a pilot. So it doesn't sound so permanent yet. Um, but I'm just going to try this, these things out. Um, what questions would you have? What questions would you have if you were trying this out? What would you want to see are the successes and challenges of it? So I'd like to collect the information for you um, so that I can help you maybe think about it. And I can help myself think about how to do it differently or better. And so I think just kind of framing it as I'm trying this out and I want your input on how to understand if it was effective or not is maybe a soft way of coming into the conversation. Uh, rather than kind of coming in, you know, guns ablaze and saying, you're right, I'm wrong, or I'm wrong, you're right type of thing uh, might be a way of uh, bringing others on board. That's an interesting um, idea to ask some questions of your colleagues to say, you know, I'm, I'm willing to learn some lessons here. I'm willing to do heavy lifting. What are you hoping that I will learn through this kind of experiment around uh, these practices, whether it's, re like I said, reassessment, or it might be something different with homework. What are some of the things that you're curious about, which in turn also has them articulate some of their hesitation, isn't it? It, it yes. forces them, not forces them, but it, it sort of engages them in a conversation to say, here's the reason I'm so hesitant about these practices. I, I think that's a really, really great idea. Um, it, it leads me now thinking about the book again that you wrote with Nathan and, and thinking about the PLC at work structure. Uh, from your perspective, why is that structure, the, the process, the structures, the systems, the routines, et cetera, why, why are they so perfectly aligned to bring about grading reform? So what are some of the specific advantages that uh, the PLC at Work model brings to the table when it comes to reforming your grading practices in your schools? that, Tom, um, in particular, because in our, in our days of, of, of doing this work, um, we were actually uh, working through the PLC at work process, trying to understand what it was like, trying to understand what it would look like for us as a you know, small, medium-sized school in Iowa to do it. And that was actually, we, we led with the PLC at work process in our school. And then grading just kind of happened to come alongside of it. And a, uh, a teacher, this is when I was a district office administrator, he called me one day and said, hey, Matt, Matt, what's the connection between this PLC stuff that we're trying to do and this SBG stuff we're trying to do? I mean, he, he asked me that question. And so I like, oh, yeah, I think I know it in my mind, but I've never articulated it with anyone else. And so, you know, for those familiar with the PLC at work process, uh, there are four critical questions that teams often tend to work through. And the first one is, um, what is exactly that our students should know and be able to do? And the second question is how we know and they have learned it. And I can't think of a better way of going through that process than with a team of teachers. Um, and I can't think of a, a better example of understanding the value of that process than the pandemic that we're in. Uh, so many educators out there are saying, I'm not, I, can't, I can't cover the same amount of content I've covered before. Well, in the PLC at Work process, uh, we're, we're, we're tasked at prioritizing or creating power standards to understand what the most important standards are that students should know and be able to learn. Uh, often teachers uh, in this kind of grading conversations, they push back on this idea of, I don't have time to teach and assess and reassess and check for understanding and reassess and grade and where am I going to find this time? And, and so uh, by, by prioritizing the standards, by focusing on uh, that first PLC at work question really helps teams of teachers do it. Um, and then, you know, how we know when they've learned it. I can't think of a better way of articulating how we know when a student has learned it. Um, than by reporting it based on the standard. So we think about reporting and communicating student learning by the student, by the standard. 
But yeah. most importantly, Tom, I think it's this. Um, it goes back to the question you just asked me earlier about being a lone ranger trying to do this work. Right. Um, it is lonely work. It is challenging work. That same teacher who asked me uh, about the connection between the PLC at work process and standards-based grading, he was a, a, a quality, quality veteran teacher. He said, Matt, I feel like a first-year teacher again doing all this stuff. Mm. And so providing him with a support system of other English teachers who could say, hey, can I look at that assessment? What, what are the most important standards for you in English 9? Because I've got these different ones, maybe in English 10. How can we calibrate on a vertical level to ensure mm. that students are learning the most appropriate things in English 9 to build upon English 10? So without those conversations, teachers, even if they're not the only one implementing those grading practices, are still going to feel like it because they don't have that support system around them uh, with some of the other what I would call not really grading stuff that supports the grading stuff. Things like creating assessments, uh, things like understanding what it really means to check for understanding in, a, in, in an effective way. Um, all of those things that really aren't related specifically to grading, but as we think about the whole continuum, of assessment, it builds right into it. And, and right. I'm speaking to the assessment expert here that can articulate that uh, <laughs> in much better ways than myself. Oh, I don't know about that, Matt, but I appreciate that. But, you know, the thing that I think you've articulated so well is that, you know, assessment is the engine that drives the collaborative teams within the PLC process, right? You, The first two questions are assessment questions. The last two questions, how will we respond if they haven't learned it? What do we do to extend the students? Is about responding to assessment evidence. And so without sound assessment practices, you know, the, 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 the process is going to fall flat. And the, the other thing that I think sometimes gets lost in all of that, which I think you, again, articulated is that grading is assessment. We sometimes forget that just because you're assessing for the summative purpose and just because you are uh, producing a report card doesn't mean the principles, PLE principles of sound assessment don't apply. So I think that going back to the question about the Lone Ranger as well, or the, the person who's going solo, I think that they're always in a position of strength when they have sound assessment practices, which come from research around what good assessment looks like, or even in grading, what good measurement looks like and, mm -hmm. and trying to bring those two things together. Um, it leads me to, you know, there's a lot of understandings out there. There's a lot of misunderstandings out there. We we talked earlier about some of the hyperbole around grades and, and especially specific to the secondary level and transcripts, et cetera. I'm wondering if there are other aspects of assessment and grading out there that from your opinion, just continue to be completely misunderstood. You know, you see something on social media or, and, and you know, social media is a really dangerous place in a way because boy, you can get people to like and retweet things. And I look at it sometimes and I think you gotta be kidding me. Um, but if you ever, you know, are there things out there where you say like, that is unequivocally incorrect, like that is just an incorrect uh, assertion. So correct the record, Matt, uh, what messages are out there uh, that continue to leave you frustrated, uh, and you think simply go too far? Yeah, I think uh, one of them, and this is going to be the, the professor in me coming out here, <laughs> is, uh, is the research side behind all of these changes and things we've been talking about, Tom. Uh, and it comes from maybe two perspectives. One is that someone will say, well, show me the research that these specific grading practices are, are better or different. And, um, and, and that's, that, that's really maybe the wrong question to ask for a couple of reasons. One is because, uh, you know, uh, one of your previous uh, guests, Tom Gusky, and some several esteemed colleagues have done some wonderful work in kind of synthesizing what the research says about grading. And basically what it says is that um, our, our typical grading practices in the past have done a very poor job of actually communicating student learning. Yeah. But what we're doing in all of these grading conversations is we're saying, I actually want to communicate learning now. <laughs> and so how can we try to use numbers to show that something right. that was never actually communicating learning is now going to better communicate learning? It's like right. saying that speaking Spanish is better than English or French or whatever. It, they're just different ways. And Right. And we hope that we're communicating in the most effect, effective and clear and transparent way. And so to try to point to some type of quantitative analysis, and, I, and I've done this, to show that, that these specific grading practices are better or different is just, mm -hmm. it's the wrong question. And it's also the wrong conversation uh, to get into. Uh, the, the second thing that I think is, is out there that sometimes gets thrown around maybe on the other side of those that don't uh, see these grading shifts as being helpful or valuable is that when we do make these grading shifts that, that somehow we are dumbing down the curriculum or that we, uh, we, we don't care about responsibility anymore 
or that students are just, you know, allowed to be as flexible as they want to. And again, we see this in the pandemic, right? And I actually saw one of my colleagues the other day said, hey, I've just been way too flexible in the midst of the pandemic. Like he felt like some of his students were kind of taking advantage of it. And, and so I understand why folks see this. But I think the missing link in all of the secondary grading reform conversations is we talk a lot about the reassessment procedures. We talk a lot about the flexible deadlines. We talk really more about a mastery mindset, but we, we, we've lost the, in, in the conversation, what's it mean to actually, for a student to be responsible? And if we're going to expect them to be responsible, we have to teach them to be responsible. Any awesome biology teacher out there could tell us the specific day that he or she taught mitosis, check for understanding of mitosis, check for understanding again of mitosis, and then summatively assess the mitosis, sell stuff. And then, but, but if we ask that same teacher, when's the day you taught what it means to be responsible? Check for understanding what it means to be responsible. Had a whole class lesson on what it means to be responsible and differentiate that between what it means to be responsible as a ninth grader versus a 12th grader. And so if we're going to teach and expect responsibility, we have to teach and expect responsibility. And we could report out the extent to which a student is being responsible or whatever other 21st century skill there is. And so I think those that kind of criticize the movement for not having a, a strong emphasis on, uh, on responsibility in 21st century skills, I think to a certain extent we have to own it. Because in general, at the secondary school level, we have not done a good job of explicitly teaching and assessing and, and laying out clear success criteria for what that means. Yeah. Uh, and again, I, I, I'm here to say, Tom, I've been a part of those conversations and I'm going to clear the air right now. No more. Hold me accountable on social media. <laughs> there you go. It is interesting how some of the um, conversations or the narratives kind of get hijacked. I, I, I think of two in particular that often come up in the trainings and workshops. One is when I talk about not penalizing late work, the sort of pushback for people is I say, you know, we need to stop penalizing late work because it distorts achievement. And the pushback is, but Tom, deadlines matter. And th that, again, is a false dichotomy. It's kind of hijacking the conversation that the idea that because you're not docking somebody for late work doesn't mean that you don't adhere to deadlines. And the other one is the homework piece, which is, um, you know, homework shouldn't contribute to a student's proficiency grade. Uh, a, it comes early in the learning and two, you can't confirm who did the work. But the response is often, but Tom, kids need to practice. Again, false dichotomy here. You're, you're, we're creating this 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 false tension between those two ideas, you know, not counting homework towards someone's achievement grade doesn't mean it's not important. So it's, it's just interesting to me. I, I think you've touched on a, a couple of really, really good points about uh, the, where's the research crowd too. That's always an interesting conversation, isn't it? Because I don't think they realize what can of worms they're opening up when we start examining the lack of research that supports traditional grading practices. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny though, but my colleague Nathan was actually in a meeting once where not in our school, but in a different school. And that, that yeah. came up. Yeah. There's some folks that said, well, what's the research say about this? And he said, all right, we're going to pause this meeting. And next meeting, everyone's bringing their research. Everyone's bringing their research, right? And I'll give you all the usernames and passwords to electronic databases. And it's just not there, Tom. You're right. It's, it's just a, the, the points and percentages and A, B, C, D, skip E, go to F. We've all inherited that system. Right. It's not like a bunch of smart people got in a room and decided it's the best way to do it. It's you just inherited <laughs> it. That's right. And I don't know anyone who, if given a magic wand and, and could have the opportunity to invent a system, would invent the tradition. Maybe somebody would. I don't. I just don't know them. Uh, who who would invent the system where we're locked into? And I think it's just. I think what happens is some of these traditional practices just they came first, and therefore they get embedded or entrenched uh, in, into our work. Um, so I want to I want to step into that research um, area. It's a good segue for us to talk about the article that you co-authored with Tom Gusky and Tom Buckmiller, uh, and it was called The Impact of Standards-Based Learning Tracking High School Students' Transition to University. That, of course, is one of the assertions that many people pushing back against standards-based grading or sound grading practices, they push back and say, our, our students aren't going to be ready for college. They're not ready for the university level. We're, we're quote unquote, dumbing it down. We know that's not true, but that's the assertion that's given. So th that study was sought to determine if the implementation of standards-based learning in high schools actually affects students' transition to learning in university courses. So tell us a little bit about the study and then tell us what you found. 
Yeah. So first, the first thing you should know about the study, Tom, is it's um, like almost every study I have the luxury now of trying to, to do, there's a personal side to it. Uh, as a former district office person, we, ha we had questions about uh, our high school students. Hey, if we do this, are we going to somehow disadvantage them getting into university? And we were fortunate enough to be 10 miles away from the biggest university in Iowa, University of Iowa, Hawkeyes down there. And so we could invite those folks to the conversation, have them, you know, kind of explain, we could ask them questions. And so we kind of were able to get the confirmation that we were not going to disadvantage them. Um, but just to make sure, uh, Tom Buckmiller and uh, another colleague and I, we actually went around and talked to all the university admissions folks in uh, public universities in Iowa and helped them help, helped them understand what some high schools in Iowa were doing. And I uh, just had a conversation with them like, is this, are students going to get a fair shot getting in? And they confirmed like, yeah, no problem, no problem at all. Like as long as there's a letter grade, a GPA, no big deal at all. Uh, and so that was kind of the first step in this personal journey that I had in trying to help high schools uh, really make this shift. But then the question turned from in the eyes of some parents and other stakeholders, all right, I understand that students are going to get a fair shot getting into college university, but what about getting through? Mm -hmm. What about once they step into that class where we know that those professors are not going to be, you know, perhaps using some of those uh, highly effective grading practices that we've talked about today? Uh, are, are, are they going to like have to go through some process? Are they going to like not have as great of a college experience? And so that's what we did um, at, a, uh, at a university, a private university. We sent out an email to all of the freshmen and said, hey, if you're, inter inter if you're interested, be a part of our study. Um, could you just let us know based upon kind of these criteria, if uh, the extent to which you, the high school that you attended implemented these grading practices. And so they kind of like self-disclose if they went to a specific standards-based grading like high school. Mm -hmm. And so then we asked them a series of questions and then we invited a subset of them to actually be a part of some interviews. And we asked them things like, hey, just tell me about, the, tell me about your high school. So we can kind of confirm the extent to which they were actually a part of a standards-based school. And there was all across the board, as you can imagine, right, Tom? There's schools out there that say they're standards-based and they're not yet there. And there's others that are really rocking it. And so we kind of found out. And one of the things we, we wrote about in our paper is that high schools in general are still kind of in the early phase of implementing these effective grading practices. Mm -hmm. But no matter where those students came from, what we found out is that they had a, a you know, probably like you and I did back in the day, a transition from being a high school student to a college student. There's a lot of temptations and challenges and, and things yeah. that go along with that. And what they told us was, is like grading practices was not really high on their list of things they had to adjust to. It was things like, you know, making friends, time management, all of those things that they had to get used to. And so we wanted to share that story with a broader audience that, that from the trenches, these freshman students at the end of their first semester told us when it was fresh in their mind, that, hey, uh, the, this, this adjustment to different grading practices at the university level was not a serious adjustment for us. Yeah. And so we hope that that message provides just a, a, a little bit of a weight off the shoulders for school board members, for principals, for teachers, for, for other folks out there who are considering making these changes in their high school. Uh, of course, it was really a, a fun study for, for me to see come to fruition a number of years later um, at the university level. Now, I wish we would have had it back in the day, Tom, when I was leading that change in, in Solon, right. Iowa. It, it, that is really interesting because, you know, so much of traditional grading has to do with leverage. It has to do with coercing behavioral compliance through almost fear mongering threats, threats about the unknowable future. When you get to college, you know, that that's where we, we gain, you know, a lot of, you know, I know back in the day when I first was teaching and I was a traditional grader, you know, that's where I gained a lot of leverage with students was, you know, wait till you get to university, you know, yes. boy, this is going to be like, and, and, and realizing and, and having some tangible evidence that that's just not the major adjustment. And it would be so easy to look at a student who did poorly in university and conflate that lack of success to the grading practices that they that they experienced in high school, when there are so many other confounding effects that that contribute to the differences between high school and college, it would just be so easy for the naysayers, if you will, to point to, well, you see, we shouldn't have implemented standards-based <laughs> grading because now our kids are failing college and university. So uh, Matt, that that is a really great 
study. And I think that's a, a wonderful contribution to the conversation because I think, I think sometimes for, for many of the right reasons, I should say, teachers are concerned about students getting into university, but at the same time, the college admissions offices, you know, I think sometimes we forget they're getting students from all over the world. Yes. You know, they're getting IB students. They're getting students from different countries that have different grading scales and somehow they figure out how to admit all those students. And it is just the idea that an Iowa school is going to take no students from the state of Iowa because they're all standards-based schools I know, is I know. just absurd. So I know where teachers are coming from. I don't mean to be disrespectful or insensitive to that, but it's just an interesting conversation. So I, I really want to thank you for that study because I think it's a, it's a wonderful contribution to the conversation, specific to the conversation at the secondary level. So I want to finish up today uh, with maybe some advice for, for getting started. We talked about the individuals starting small and, and going from there, but let's say I'm a school principal and I've got a few teachers. So I've got a few teachers starting small. I've got this kind of guiding coalition. I've got this team of people who are early adopters and they're pursuing grading reform. I know it's important. Um, you know, I can see the big picture and uh, trying to build this different kind of assessment culture. So how do we go from that small team? So I've got those early adopters. What's the key in your mind or what are the keys in your mind to building consensus? How do we go from the small group of early adopters who started small? How do we start to broaden that to it becoming a school mandate? Yeah, so in our experience, uh, and we write about this a little bit in Making Grades Matter, is it first starts again with establishing a building or district-wide purpose. Here's what the purpose of grading is in our building or in our district. And then once we have the, that specific purpose in mind, now we're going to articulate um, you know, maybe three to five principles. I think I've heard you talk about this, Tom, a little bit about making sure we have um, some specific grading principles in mind. And we're going to focus on those principles, right? It's, it's one thing to say, oh, we're doing standards-based or standards reference grading. It's another thing on paper to articulate exactly what we mean by that. Right. And so first purpose, and then having some specific principles. And then with the pilot, you see the, the P's I'm going with here, Tom? Uh, yep. Purpose, you. principle, and pilot. With that mm -hmm. pilot, we're going to give them permission now to try out those principles. And uh, one of the things I learned a lot from, um, I think it was Rick DeFore, he talked about uh, reciprocal accountability. He talked about creating tight and loose structures in a PLC at work process. And so what we did is we decided that we're going to also have tight and loose um, kind of uh, principles that go along with our standards-based grading implementation process. And so that's what I recommend that schools do as well. So I said, okay, everybody's going to do this aspect of homework, we're, we're, we're not going to um, uh, assign any point value to it, but what freedom are we going to allow teachers to have? Mm -hmm. And so with that pilot group, kind of figure out what that, where those parameters are. Um, same thing with reassessments, right? Like I, I wish that I could go back and, and reassess in my high school government class to improve my grade. That's just not a reality, right? And so right. within the reporting period, right? Like let's, okay, maybe we can squeeze it down. All right, maybe reassessments are going to be between two weeks and five weeks or something. I don't know, whatever those parameters are that a school decides, let's allow our pilot group to start helping establish what some of those parameters are that are going to contextualize these changes for us in our school. So yeah. that way, when we present it to the next group, it's not just A, a free for all, and, and B, now we have some kind of some, some time-tested um, parameters to work within. At yeah. some point in time though, Tom, there, there's every school, every school, there's teachers that are excited about it, the early adopters, there's teachers who are, you know, I'll do it if I see the early adopters doing it. And there's some that like, they're like, you know what, I just like my job here. And so I'm just going to do it to keep my job here. And there's others that for whatever reason, don't understand it or don't believe in it yet. Right. And so um, at some point in time, the schools that I've seen after they go through that pilot process, maybe even bring on another group of teachers, they just say, hey, we're doing this because as you can see over here with this group of teachers, it's happening. And so now within the next one or two years, I expect you to do this. Yeah. And I think sometimes uh, what can be really helpful is to not only have those specific grading principles laid out, but as we did in Making Grades Matter, to articulate what it means to implement those specific grading principles. Uh, so in our book, you'll see at the end of every chapter, there's kind of like a getting started, uh, kind of a middle ground, and then what it means to really implement that specific grading practice at a high level. And I believe the, the, the best school years I know are going to provide both pressure and support for teachers to get there. The support is here is the continuum and I'm gonna give you the time to get there. I'm gonna pay for a sub so you can get some support from somebody else. Or I'm gonna buy a book from Solution Tree so you can learn more about it. Or I'm gonna send you to the assessment and grading conference so you can learn more about it. 
but I'm still expecting you to get there. Right. Uh, and, and so I think that's really what it takes. Uh, and, and I'm just so happy to, to, to know that there's uh, wonderful, wonderful school years out there that get and understand this, yeah. but it's not easy work as you and I both know. No, it's not. You're, you're reminding me of uh, an experience I had very early in my career. And I have to give a shout out to a former principal that I worked with. His name was Bill Bidlake. And in one high school that we were having these grading conversations in, he, he talked about our first year actually being our year zero. Ooh. It was being our year of exploration. Uh, we're going to put this content in front of people at every faculty meeting. We're going to talk about it. We're going to make sure and that everybody knows that going into next year, this is what's expected. He, he was just masterful at, at uh, uh, one of Bill's real strengths was managing personnel, if you will. And I don't mean that in the cynical sense, but he was just really great at messaging. He understands, he understood people as well as any principal I've ever worked with. Um, and then of course, you know, from, from, from my role in that, it was kind of being the pit bull assessment guy, <laughs> engineering those conversations. But I just thought that set a great tone. I learned, I learned a lot from that experience you know, that's going back to the 2006, 2007 school year. I learned a lot from that experience about pacing the work. Mm -hmm. And uh, I thought that was very wise on his part to say, we're, we're going to take a year of exploration. And of course, in that year of exploration, what do you have? You have early adopters yes. and they start to become the models. And pretty soon we had some real momentum going in that school. So uh, really, really uh, a great experience. So I, I love that description from you because you brought, you took me, you took me back to 2006, <laughs> Matt. That was great. Uh, Matt, listen, this was, uh, this has been a great conversation from my perspective. I, I could, you know, I know you and I could both talk about assessment and grading all day, but we don't, we can't turn this into a four hour, uh, <laughs> four hour episode. <laughs> so we're going to have you back for sure. At some point down the road, uh, you know, uh, whether it be another book or any research findings that you have some, somewhere along the way, I know I'm going to have you back, Matt, because I've really, really enjoyed this conversation, but we're going to finish up today, as you know, with a segment I call three questions, and that's going to be uh, a little bit of a, a, a fun turn here to ask you three lighthearted questions so listeners can get to know you a little bit more on a personal level. Nothing too intrusive, of course, but I'm just going to ask you a series of questions and you take those questions in whatever direction you want to take them. <clears throat> so here's sure. the first one. First one will be an easy one, Matt. What is the most underrated aspect of living in Iowa? Ooh, wow. Most underrated aspect of living in Iowa. Um, what, pe what don't people get about Iowa? Well, first, you know, if, if you just drive through on Interstate 80, Tom, uh, and that's really what most people do if they've never been here, uh, <laughs> is they just see the cornfields, right? They see cornfield, 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 Iowa City, cornfield, 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 Des Moines, cornfield, 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 <laughs> Council Bluffs, right? I mean, they feel the same way about Iowa that I feel about driving through Nebraska from my family go. vacations to Colorado. So um, <laughs> it's, it's more than just cornfields, I think. Um, we have a very, very, very... Um, I'll say this very accessible uh, state park system, Tom. So if you're ever in mm. Iowa, check out the state parks. There's no, uh, there's no registration. There's no fee. You just drive your car and you go to the state parks, which is wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of good, no, not, not like mountain hiking, but just very good scenic hiking uh, bluffs in different areas, uh, rivers and ponds and trout streams, and just a, a wonderful place to uh, go outdoors. You know, one of the nice things about living in Iowa is uh, the population density, right? Like there's, mm -hmm. there's a reason that people leave Iowa to go somewhere else during spring break because of the weather. Right. Uh, but, the, you know, the population density is, is desirable. And mm -hmm. I kind of joke, like if, if San Diego got transplanted into Iowa, like our, you know, there, if we had that nice of weather, our population density would just skyrocket. Right. Um, but as a result of, the, of, of there not being as many people here in Iowa, um, it makes the state parks that much more enjoyable too, because they're not very busy. Yeah. Yeah. Ha having been to Iowa several times for sure. Um, I know what you're talking about with the, uh, cornfield, 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 Des Moines. <laughs> yep. Yep. You got it. <laughs> but I, I have thoroughly enjoyed, I think I've been to Iowa close to half a dozen times and, and I was I always enjoyed my time there. Uh, okay. Second question. Um, and this is a, this or that, uh, choice here. Okay. Uh, Marvel or DC superheroes? Oh boy, you're testing my knowledge here. Uh, <laughs> uh, ooh, Marvel, maybe because my couple of my boys are interested in it, but okay. uh, I, I don't know a whole lot about either one. Actually, okay, well, I right just throw but, that yeah, out Marvel, there. Marvel, just because my kids maybe are more interested in it than the other. Yeah. Do they have a favorite? 
Oh, anything that's on the TV, probably anything they can find on, you know, on the screen somewhere, but yeah, yeah, that's a good one. That's a good one. Well, yeah. I, and, and for me, if it's Marvel, it begins and ends with Deadpool for two reasons. Uh, the movies Deadpool were filmed here in, in Vancouver really? and, uh, and Ryan Reynolds is Canadian. So, uh, I'm all over, uh, I'm all over Deadpool. <laughs> like a special Canadian bond, isn't it, Tom? Tom yeah, yeah. There's just something special about we, the we are, um, We are obnoxious about telling you which famous people are Canadian. And I think it's because we think we get a little piece of that. Uh, okay. I, I don't know what it is, but we take pride. If anyone famous is Canadian, we will make sure you know about that. <laughs> hey, okay. rightly all so. Right. You ready for this one, Matt? Here's sure. the third one. We're going to dig deep here, Matt. What is okay. something what is something about yourself that even you sometimes find annoying? Mm, man. Mm. Like you look in the mirror and go, "Yeah, I'm going to have to give them that one." All right, if you if I were to if I were to get really close here my nose. It's crooked, Tom. <laughs> At I can't point, see it. I, at I can't see it. At some point in time. Okay. So at some point in time, it, it, here's how I found out as well. You know, I've got four kids and uh, they're at, at least two of them are at the age where they're just unfiltered and they just talk. And so uh, the, the two older, the two older boys, they've at different times said, why is your nose crooked dad? <laughs> and I, I think it goes back to playing like junior high basketball or something like that and getting hit in the face. I was not that great of a basketball player, Tom. Uh, wore glasses, broke glasses, uh, had kind of the Horace Grant rec specs for a while type of thing because okay. broke so many glasses. Yeah. But it's annoying, uh, mostly because it, it when it comes up in conversation, it comes up at the most inopportune times. <laughs> like when just like the, the dentist or something like, hey, did you something happen to your nose? <laughs> I, I don't want to talk about that. People need filters, don't they? Yes. Um, I was thinking more about characteristics or attributes. Oh, but, gotcha. Uh, well, we can go but, there too. But yeah, you, we can go there but too. you went down, uh, you went down the, what I look like. I meant figuratively look in the mirror and yeah, say, oh, okay, yes, I am right, annoying right. that way. But yeah, that's okay. Yeah. We can, we can leave it there. Sure. All right. um, <laughs> have you got one that comes to mind? Uh, I was thinking um, my, just, I don't know. It's just the way I am. I, I too often, if I see a, like a fact that is just blatantly not true. Just, I just sometimes cannot, I just can't hold back the temptation, Tom, to go yeah. on Google and find the source and be like, plop, right there. It's, right. it's not a good trait. Um, yeah. It's good for being a researcher, but not good for, for, <laughs> uh, for uh, making friends and influencing people sometimes. <laughs> It's not good for the uh, the social dynamic. Let's put it that way, right? Yeah, it's it's good. good for being right, though. It's good for being right. Well, that's yeah. Uh, it, yeah. It's <laughs> I think there's a if it's just opinions and perspectives, that's great. But you know, if yeah, if you tell me the population of Iowa is you know five hundred thousand, I'm gonna make sure you know it's a lot more than five hundred thousand. Yeah, well, yeah, like you said, I think every one of those kinds of attributes and qualities have a good place and, and sometimes Ugh. can be our downfall. That's for sure. Yes, uh, la last question, Matt, uh, as you know, as I know you've listened to a few episodes, you know that I always end in every interview with a question about success and happiness. It's kind of a theme I'm trying to, to run through the podcast with everyone I interview. So the question I always finish with is, uh, of course, this one, if a random person stopped you on the street and asked you, what is your definition of success? How would you answer them? Yeah, um, I'd say a couple things. Uh, one is, um, for me, success is just knowing that um, I have not arrived. And like, to, to me, like, anytime I feel like in my worldly sense that I have gotten somewhere, uh, just the just being knocked back by someone, something, an event, and just realizing that, um, that, hey, you haven't arrived yet. To me, that is success. Mm -hmm. um, I'll never forget when um, I completed my first graduate degree. I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm on top of the world. You know, I've got this degree. And then eventually I kind of realized that um, I didn't really know as much as I thought, just based upon some conversations I had with some people. And I thought, wow, I need to learn more. And so I just kept learning more and learning more and learning more. And I thought maybe one day if I get a doctorate degree, I might have arrived to be successful. But then mm -hmm. I'm now surrounded by a bunch of people that do have their doctorates. And as it turns out, I really don't know hardly anything about the things they know about. And even the things I thought I knew about. And so mm -hmm. to me, that, um, that sense of just being reminded of, um, 
of stuff I don't know. That's why I write. That's why I talk to people like you, Tom, to, to, to find out what I don't know and how I can say and think about things differently. To me, that's success um, because that's what keeps me going. That's what keeps me going. But when I, when I hit that pitfall in the road and I think that I have arrived or that I think I'm the expert or that I know something, um, it seems in the moment as being successful. But every, t- every time I look back, Tom, every single time I realize it was only success for a moment. Right. Um, but it's moving above and beyond and past that and understanding how, that's, how that moment was actually a setback um, really is what um, helps me maybe define success. Maybe there's just some, some things I, I feel and understand about uh, kind of faith as well that, that play in there that I have to continually realize that there's a lot of things I don't do right in life um, that also fuel me to move forward too. So uh, just appreciate the, the focus you've had on that uh, topic in your, in your podcast. Yeah. Tom. Oh, thank, thanks, Matt. You know, it, it's um, sometimes cliches are cliches because they're true. And it just makes me think of success is not a destination. Success is the journey mm-hmm. and, uh, and not feeling you've ever arrived uh, can, can really fuel a, a continual, um, not just an obsession with external success, but, but fuel that internal drive to, to maximize our potential as, as not just as professionals, but as human beings. Right. So I, mm-hmm. I do appreciate that perspective. Uh, Matt, thanks so much for being here today. Uh, listeners, you definitely should follow Matt on Twitter. Uh, his Twitter handle is at MC Townsley. And yes, you heard me right, MC Townsley. Uh, Matt has a future career in hip hop if he ever wants it. Uh, but yes, it's at MC Townsley. And that is also Matt's website where there is just a ton of great information. Matt does an exceptional job of, of sort of collating and curating uh, different books and different articles around standards-based grading. Um, and I've appreciated being included in some of those lists and all of that. So thank you for that, Matt. But uh, www.mctownsley.net. And again, I, I, I can't say MC Townsley with a straight face because <laughs> it just makes me think that Matt's got a future career, maybe in the in the karaoke hip hop world. There you uh, go. Maybe someday we'll see Matt down there. So Matt, thanks so, uh, so much for being here today. I look forward to next time. Thank you, Tom. Appreciate it. This week in Assessment Corner, I'm going to pick up where we left off last week and finish up the content about the process for leading change in assessment and grading. And you'll recall from last week that uh, this segment is basically based on an article I read years ago by Harvard business professor John Cotter. The article was called Leading Change, Why Transformation Efforts Fail, and it was published in March of 1995, originally. The article essentially talks about what's necessary to transform an organization and why so many change efforts fail. Now, if you haven't listened to last week's segment, that might be a good idea before you listen to this week's, simply because last week I covered steps one through four, uh, and this week I'm covering steps five through eight. So if you're a new listener or you hadn't quite got through last week's segment, it might be a good idea. You know, last week we talked about step one, establishing a sense of urgency. My recommendation is to also pair that with patience, right? So look at your context, take inventory on where you are, and balance between urgency and patience based upon the size of your audience, but finding that balance is an important part. Step two, forming a guiding coalition so that you have a team that can do some exploration and do some heavy lifting and do some thinking on behalf of the faculty. Step three was creating the vision. And remember, we talked last week about the importance when it comes to assessment and grading, this being such an emotionally charged topic that it's good to have a vision that addresses both the emotional and the technical aspects of the change at hand. And then step four was communicating the vision. You know, you communicate the vision through your words and and frequently talking about that vision, but also through your action, right? We want to get good at a few things first before we try to expand things. So let's move to steps five through eight. Step five in the process of change, according to John Cotter, is to empower others to act on the vision. So Cotter writes, quote, successful transformations begin to involve large numbers of people as the process progresses. Employees are emboldened to try new approaches, to develop new ideas, and to provide leadership. The only constraint is that the actions fit within the broad parameters of the overall vision. The more people involved, the better the outcome, end quote. So he goes on to say that all of the obstacles people can face, of all the obstacles people can face, quote, perhaps the worst of all are bosses who refuse to change and who make demands that are inconsistent with the overall effort, end quote. 
So here, potentially, you have a couple of scenarios that, that could be possible in your context. You know, it's clear, for example, that your district is headed in one particular direction, but the principal of the school may not support it wholeheartedly, or the principal of the school, and this is the direction we're going, but one of the department chairs doesn't really support that direction, right? So you could have, let's go back to that principal. You could have a principal who isn't 100% on board uh, with this change. Yes, we are moving to a more standards-based assessment and grading paradigm and system, etc. But the principal may also say, but I still need those three entries into your gradebook each week in the online gradebook. So they're saying one thing, but they're actually acting in another way. Or you have a situation where the principal is all in with the change efforts and the direction that the district is going, but and, and maybe it's a new principal to the school, and maybe one of the more veteran assistant principals, uh, inadvertently or intentionally, acts in a somewhat subversive way. So you can have all of these scenarios where we, we really want to give some empowerment for people to act, and there is no greater empowerment than sort of this sponsorship that can come from administration. Empowerment comes, like I said, from this kind of sponsorship, because school administrators often have to run interference and provide cover for new initiatives and areas of focus, right? Change is always risky, and those who are primarily responsible for implementing the changes, you know, teachers, they can feel exposed if things don't go perfectly the first time. And guess what? They won't. So as teachers implement new routines around, you know, reassessment or homework or assessment design, it would be wise to predict that questions, maybe even challenges, are going to come. A full-throated endorsement of that change effort sends the message from the principal or from the leader that this is a focused, purposeful effort and not some random haphazard attempt just to be different or just to sort of catch on to the latest fad. Now, the other piece of empowerment for me is the desire to provide teachers and others with multiple points of entry into the change effort. And this is one of the things I wrote about in Grading from the Inside Out. I wrote about those three big ideas of what I call the standards-based mindset. I talked about giving kids full credit for their learning, redefining accountability, and repurposing homework. Those were the sort of three major points of entry. And of course, there are minor points of entry within that. So as an example, you could, as you begin to explore these practices, you could have a science department uh, focused on reassessment routines, while the English department is trying to re-envision, you know, how to handle missing and late assignments. So they're trying to redefine accountability. Uh, you could have the math department at the same time working on new routines around homework and practice, and, and so and, and on it goes. So you have multiple points of entry as you begin to explore that change, because giving teachers some autonomy of choice within the parameters of the change effort is what truly is empowering. So allowing for those multiple points of entry. And that leads to step six. Step six, I think, is one of the most important steps to be very mindful of. Step six is about planning for and creating short-term wins. Here's what Cotter says, quote, real transformation takes time and a renewal effort risks losing momentum if there are no short-term goals to meet and celebrate. Most people won't go on the long march unless they see compelling evidence within 12 to 24 months that the journey is producing the expected results. Without short-term wins, too many people give up or actively join the ranks of those people who have been resisting the change the whole time, end quote. The multiple points of entry we just talked about allow everyone, first, to be motivated to a degree, since they had some choice as to where to begin. And two, it allows for multiple, you know, sort of action research projects to take place so we can collectively learn from each other's experiences. You know, three to five year plans and visions are important, no doubt, but what matters the most are short-term wins. That's why... I often, when I'm working with schools or districts, will try to guide them to think about those short-term wins. So, for example, a district might say to me, you know, Tom, we want to have a new report card for K-12 to in the next three years, all levels, elementary school, middle school, high school. Uh, and I'll say to them, okay, that's great. That's the vision. But where do you need to be by the winter break to make that happen, right? What needs to be implemented, engineered, explored by the end of this school year to know that you're on track for that long-term goal? I mean, don't talk about a new report card 
if what ends up going on the new report card is information that's determined from the old assessment methods. So the practices that produce the grades are far more important than the structure of that report card at this point of the change. So as I said earlier, you know, change is risky. So some positive early momentum can go a long way to securing the long-term commitment to seeing the change through. I know it's cliche. I've said this many times on the podcast, but it's really true. Think big, start small, and plan for those short-term wins. Which leads us to step seven. And step seven, Cotter says, is to consolidate improvements and then produce more change, right? This step is really about making sure we don't declare victory too soon. I honestly can't count the number of times I've been to schools and districts where there is this kind of collective sense amongst uh, the district staff or principals, and they kind of say, say to me, you know, Tom, we're kind of past that. We, we need to go to the next level. And then it, it takes me half a day or a couple of hours to figure out that they're actually not past that and that there's, they've, they've just declared victory uh, on this first stage uh, too soon. As the expression made famous by Jim Collins goes, good is the enemy of great. So here's what Cotter writes about consolidating improvements. After a few years of hard work, managers may be tempted to declare victory with their first clear performance improvement. While celebrating a win is fine, he says, declaring the war won can be catastrophic. Until changes sink deeply into a company's culture, a process that can actually take up to five to ten years, new approaches are fragile and subject to regression. End quote. So as new assessment and grading practices begin to show themselves as the norm and are now the dominant part of the culture, this is the time to pounce. So as leaders, for example, when hiring, and look, I know that in many districts there is little to no control over this, and in other districts there'll be uh, much more control over it. But, you know, so it varies the degree to which you would have control over this. But when hiring, you can begin to ask more specific interview questions about how, for example, a teacher's experience and approach to assessment and grading align with the vision that you established as a school back in step three. So at least now you have a bit of a foundation from which to judge whether or not they're the right fit for the context. This is also the stage where you can reinvigorate your change efforts, right? So this could be a place where the grade three team chooses a new area of focus or the science department chooses a, a new point of entry. Maybe it's multiple grade levels or multiple departments uh, are starting to consolidate because they all chose the same uh, entry point. So maybe, for example... Uh, English and world languages and fine arts were all exploring the issues around accountability and what we do about later missing work. So the question would be, what did they learn? What recommendations would they make to the staff at large? How can we consolidate that change going forward? You have momentum. So we need to be purposeful about keeping it through a reinvigoration of new possibilities. A three-year plan could be a three-year plan, or a three-year plan could be a series of one-year plans that go through two reinvigorations. Like this might be a way that you can start to minimize the impact of what Michael Fullen calls the implementation dip. It may not avoid it altogether, but you might be able to minimize its impact by going through this purposeful renewal, which leads us to step eight. Step eight is about institutionalizing new approaches. So again, Cotter writes, quote, in the final analysis, change sticks when it becomes the way we do things around here. When it seeps into the bloodstream of the corporate body, he says, until new behaviors are rooted in social norms and shared values, they are subject to degradation as soon as the pressure for change is removed, end quote. For me, this is where policy comes in. Many schools and districts I work with initially think to themselves, let's change the policies as a way of kickstarting this change effort. Now that can work, don't get me wrong, but when it comes to assessment and grading, I'd say it's pretty risky. And more often than not, it either backfires or pushes resistance underground. The good news with policy is that you get forced compliance, right? Everyone has to do it uh, because we all want to be responsible employees and we like our jobs and we want to support our families. And so nobody sort of steps outside the expectation. Uh, but the downside of policy changes that are premature is you get forced compliance, and now everyone is doing it because they've been told to do it, not because they feel compelled that this is the most important thing that we need to work on. You know, you've heard me say this before. There is no more emotionally charged topic in my 30 years in education 
than grading. To force policy changes that the context is not collectively ready for, knowing it's an emotional topic means one of two things. One, it means you're ignorant to the fact that folks aren't ready for it, and that's a problem. Or two, you are aware of it, but you just don't care, and you want to purposefully initiate some sort of confrontation. You're going to have to live with the fallout of that, okay? You have to know that you might, you might permanently damage relationships and trust when it comes to, to working with your colleagues going forward. Listen, people like getting paid, right? They like their jobs. They love the work. So what happens when you force policy changes that are premature often is that resistance goes underground. So they'll go through the motions, right? They'll, they'll, they'll do what they're told to do. Um, they'll go through all those motions to ensure that they stay out of trouble, but their hearts aren't in it. And, and that is, is, you know, again, going to serve to be a long-term problem. So for me, institutionalizing happens when everyone sort of looks around and thinks to themselves, you know, we should make this a policy because most of us, if not all of us, are doing it this way anyway, right? So as the expression goes, as bottom up as possible and only as top down as necessary. Now, are there exceptions to this? Well, of course there are. But for me, assessment and grading policies should be the last thing to change, not the first. Now, I've seen it backfire too many times uh, you know, for this not to be a thing. It's just something I've seen often where trying to change policies too soon ends up creating more headaches than it's worth. So to review, step one, we establish a sense of urgency, but in our context, we're gonna pair that with patience, urgency for the ideas, patience with people, and we're gonna look at our context, take inventory and think about where we are and why things need to change. We're gonna form step two, a guiding coalition that's going to do the exploration, do some heavy lifting, and begin to sort of forge ahead with some initial thoughts on what this might look like. From there, we create a vision. And I cannot emphasize enough how important it is that the vision address both the emotional and the technical sides, especially when we're talking about assessment and grading. We want and you know, to be able to express that. And that's why I talked last week about the true north from grading from the inside out. Accurate grades, confident learners, the technical and the emotional argument. Once you have that vision, it's important that we communicate the vision. We communicate it with our words. And as I said earlier and last week, we want to communicate it frequently to parent meetings and stakeholders, etc. But we also want to communicate it through our actions. We want to live what our vision is. We don't just want to talk about it. We want to live that vision. We want to get good, as I've said several times now, we want to get good at a few things first before we try to, to expand uh, you know, our repertoire. Step five is to empower others to act on that vision, right? Create multiple points of entry. And as a leader, whether, again, whether you are a principal, assistant principal, or a department chair, or a grade level team leader, or whatever your role or responsibility is as a leader, giving overt sponsorship to these ideas is important because you're going to be able to run interference you know, on any sort of external pressure that may be coming, and it can be seen as a collective effort as opposed to one teacher who's gone rogue. Step six, plan for and create short-term wins. Again, more frequent cycles of renewal. Try to offset that in inevitable implementation dip. We just keep, keep renewing, keep renewing, keep it fresh, keep it fresh. Is it a three-year plan? Is it a five-year plan? Or is it a series of one-year plans that continually get renewed through our change effort? Uh, step seven is to consolidate improvements and produce more change. So again, learn from the collective efforts and begin to align practices amongst the wider sort of audience or the wider uh, staff, you know, across departments or across grade levels. So maybe now the grade four and the grade five team have alignment with how they're, you know, managing their grade books or how they're thinking about homework or how they're thinking about reassessment or accountability or all those different, different issues that we may be talking about. And step eight is institutionalizing those new approaches. This is where we start thinking about policies, establishing these new norms as just that. This is the way we do business here. So I'll finish this segment by just repeating the quote I opened with last week. And this is what John Cotter writes, and just as a reminder. Quote, The most general lesson to be learned from the more successful cases is that the change process goes through a series of phases that, in total, usually require a considerable length of time. Now listen to this carefully. He says, quote, Skipping steps creates only the illusion of speed and never produces a satisfying result. We want to prioritize 
getting it right. And that may mean sacrificing being first. Okay, a couple of announcements before we close out today. A reminder first about the Achieve Institute, which is the institute focused on promising practices in instruction, assessment, and grading. That's going virtual this August, August 16 through 18. It features myself, Cassandra Erkins, Nicole Dimich, as well as Katie White. So if you're interested in that event, head over to the solutiontree.com website for details. And I've also added a link for that event in the show notes. Next, an update on the summer series that I mentioned last week. Uh, as a reminder, this June, July, and August, I'm going to do a couple of things. One is we're going to go to an every other week format. So probably seven episodes this June, uh, July, and August. And rather than the usual format, I'm going to try to create a summer series that's focused on special topics or specific topics. So what I'll do is I'll bring together multiple educators and experts for a conversation around some special topics that will be the entire episode. We're not going to do the regular format. So this is where you come in. Uh, in the show notes, and I'll also tweet this out from the podcast Twitter account. So if you're not following the Twitter account at Tom Schimmer Pod, please do so. Uh, so you can follow this link. I'll send out a link. There's one in the show notes. I'll tweet it out uh, for a Google survey where I've listed nine potential topics that I have in mind for this summer. And again, we're only going to do seven episodes, so I need your input. So I'd like you through the survey to rank those nine topics from one to nine in order that you would like to see. So, you know, one being the one you'd like to see most, nine being the one that you'd like to see the, the least. Now, after you've done that ranking, there's also another section there where you can add a topic that I didn't list. So I'm going to keep this survey open until probably the end of April, and that will help me decide which topics we're going to cover this June, July, and August. Now, come September, we'll get back to the usual format, but I thought it might be fun to do something over the summer that wasn't so time sensitive and wasn't so sort of topical week to week. You need some downtime over the summer. Um, I need some downtime. So the weekly pace is something we're going to relax uh, going into the fall. And then when we get back into September, we'll kind of hit our usual pace from there. So as I said, remember to follow the podcast Twitter account at Tom Shimmer Pod. You'll get updates on the survey and updates on the um, episodes as well. Follow me on Twitter uh, personally at Tom Shimmer, uh, Shimmer Education on Facebook and Tom Shimmer Podcast on Instagram. And also please email your questions for Assessment Corner or any suggestions you have for the podcast. That's Tom Shimmer Pod at gmail.com. And one more reminder, don't forget to check out the YouTube channel, uh, Tom Schirmer Podcast on YouTube. Next week, my guest will be Leanne Young. Leanne is the CEO of Lead Inclusion. She is a clinical professor at San Diego State University. She is a dear friend, and she's an educator for whom I could not have more respect. So our focus is going to be on UDL and assessment. Please subscribe, rate, review the podcast, especially on Apple Podcasts, of course. And if you like what you hear, Please feel free to spread the word about the podcast to your friends, your colleagues, or on social media. I would really appreciate that. Have a great week, everyone.